Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic Roundtable Hi. Show. This is episode 529. Um, we're recording this live on Friday, September the 18th, around 8.30. We actually started promptly, unlike last week, where we were considerably later in starting. We've got a great panel. We got and it wasn't a... even my fault. No, it wasn't. And we've got a great guest on the show, a friend of the show, a former uh, long-term panellist, and he's a returned as a guest panellist. Um, we've got some fantastic stories. I'm going to let the panel quickly introduce themselves. First, they are... Guest panelist, a returning full time panelist, Moulton. Moulton, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? You're muted. Hello. <laughs> I don't know how to operate machinery. <laughs> right. I'm Morton. Uh, you, you, you only make your living recording trains. I know. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but not through Zoom. Uh, right, they're, they're, right. Yeah, oh, that's oh, a good oh. enough intro. Yeah, let's, Move let's, on. Get on, let's get on with this. <laughs> Vito, Vito, would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted as well. Yes, I'm Vito. I'm the founder of uh, WP Feedback, which is a project delivery system for uh, WordPress professionals, uh, saving more than 80% now of uh, project delivery time. That's great. Damn, you have some serious gear behind you, man. Uh, yeah. and, um, You're trying to kill your neighbors with your awesome <laughs> licks. Yeah. Now it's just uh, furniture in the background. Now actually, is. actually, Walton, <laughs> he he can really play his guitar. Um, with that gear, yeah, yeah. I mean, world class uh, guitar player. Uh, um, Chris, uh, um, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Chris from Lifter LMS, which is a learning management system for WordPress. You can find it, the free core on the WordPress repository. Also have a podcast for people teaching online called LMS Cast. Spencer, would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted. I'm Spencer Farman. All right. Um, Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, Stephen Satter from zipfish.io. And Sally, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Sally. <laughs> the WP right. fangirl. Right, yeah. Before we go into the main um, stories of the week, I just want to mention one of our great sponsors, and that's Kinsta Hosting. Kinsta have been hosting the show, uh, sponsoring the show, and hosting it for about three years now. Fantastic hosting. I only host uh, WordPress websites. If you're looking for a great hosting partner for yourself or for your clients, I don't think you could do better than Kinsta. Fantastic interface. They use Google Cloud as their backbone. Fantastic support and all the other bells and whistles that you're looking for at endless lists, which I'm not going to tell you about in this short advert. But if that sounds really interesting, go over to Kinsta. I suggest you buy one of their packages. And the main thing is tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So into story one. Uh, a bright future for WordPress depends on today's actions. And um, I'm going to throw this over to you, Morton, because you've got limited time. And you were, um, you were kind of um, linked into the story. So what did you think of this one, Morton? Uh, so... I think that my part in this is, well, the larger story is that WordPress is approaching the web as if the web is 20, as if it's 2012, right? The, the way the web works today isn't the way it did in 2012 at all. Uh, the web stack has changed, the behavior of the users have changed and the expectations of the users have changed. Um, and the big selling point of WordPress, the five minute install, which was never the case, um, is becoming an absurd selling point in, an issue, in a time when all you need to do to publish anywhere else is to just log in and start publishing. Um, my article, which was linked to within that article, talks about this shift in user behavior away from the idea of publishing content onto the web for posterity to publishing content yeah. on the web for ephemeral uh, sharing. Um, and the most significant part of that is you're starting to see the people who used to use blogs to publish their thoughts are shifting over to platforms that very deliberately do not store what you publish. You're seeing it in, you used to see it in TikTok, uh, sorry, not TikTok, the uh, uh, Snapchat, where people would actually publish stories inside Snapchat that only last for 24 hours. And not only that, but you can only see them once. Um, that 
type of behavior has now shifted over to Instagram. Um, I'll show you an example. So this is um, for all of you who follow Dancing with the Stars carefully. This is Sharna Burgess, you know, the one of the people. So this is a typical Instagram story. So you can see here, it's a story, uh, which is a picture of someone else's text. So this is a picture of a news story. And then she has added some comments on top of it. And there's an even, in, even an interactive component to the stories. So you can click here and respond to her. And then the next slide is someone having responded. So this is a response. And then it's her response to the original story. Again, all pictures of text. And then we keep going. Again, someone's response from the form. Then picture of text of her response to the response. And then someone else's response to the response underneath. Now, the thing about this is, no this is I actually how... Instagram stories. But yeah, this but, is actually yeah, how I've people gotta, are... I've got to intervene here. No, 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 no. Let me finish. Okay, well, yeah, you, no, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. I've given you a fair whack at this. But the truth is, you know, I, I think you, you are partly right, but, you know, it depends on the content, doesn't it? And the context. Yes, but the thing is, all of this stuff used to happen in a blog post followed by comments in the blog post. Yeah, but that's No all one heard. wants that's that all... anymore. What they no, want to be able to... I think them. Morton has a good point here with regard to the fact that these are pictures of text. I mean, yeah. I started using Instagram about a year ago. And I use it for pictures, like, you know, of the cats, of the garden, of the, uh, 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 you know, with maybe like a caption. Um, and, you know, I had seen on Twitter people posting screenshots of longer text because that was the only way to fit it into Twitter. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, it worked for that, except, you know, um, hello, accessibility. Uh, but to have an entire, you know, on, on the rare occasions when I've looked at Instagram stories, it's been more visually oriented. But to, like, take a medium for pictures and force your text into it, because I don't know, you don't know how to use anything else. All your followers are on Instagram. I, I'm not sure. Um, Instant satisfaction. That's what it is. These are it's, like short attention span viewers. They just want immediate feedback. Like, no, so no, take no, a no, picture. no. It is so much more. It's part of what Sally says that it's because that's where the people are. It's also because they want absolute control over what it looks like. And most importantly, they do not want it to last forever. Uh, I think you're they specifically sorry. Sorry. want it to last I'm, only. I think you're totally going. Yeah, well, you're an old. Jonathan, I'm sorry. You're an <laughs> no, no, I think you, and I know, I know intellectual argument that's strong went from one that's pretty weak, and I'm just hearing one that's pretty weak. Uh, Chris, <laughs> uh, um, I, what do you reckon? Because I think, I think the um, situation is much broader than what um, Malton is trying to outline here, really. And you're muted, Chris. I think that the uh, blog did not kill the book. And what we have here is the, I, I do agree that if, if ephemerality is on the rise, but there's still a place for blogs and creators. And a lot of it in pop cultures these days, what I look for, or what I want is like the facts, but what you get like on the news, for example, is reaction. Yeah. So ephemerality is a platform for reaction, but there still has to be the source original content, whether that's a photo, a video, some text or whatever. And um, if the niche is, and, and the people who value that niche, not everybody has a short attention span. And uh, so there it is possible to have long form content uh, right. still. So. Yeah. So, yes. um, oh, you've got a little friend behind you. Um, I'm going to let you have one more go at this, Morton. But you're going to have to come up with some better intellectual okay. arguments than what you've, what you've just come up with for this one to fly. So This one's a, a fly? There, okay, no, so uh, the, well, uh, welcome this, to the reality argument. where the majority of users are on these <laughs> platforms and not on other things. But whatever. Like, you can go live in your little closet where nothing is happening. But, <laughs> but... And I say this with absolute emphasis. I'm not saying that blogging is going to go away. I'm saying that the majority it of people that like used to turn... You did, about, you did about five minutes ago. No, no what he said I didn't. is there are a bunch of people who w w might once have used a 
long form text content who are instead using an ephemeral visual content. Exactly. Because when people were go turning to Blogger, what they were doing was they were making web logs and then they were making like the, you know, the blog rolls and they were connecting with friends over, over blogs. It used to be Blogger and Movable Type and WordPress and all these other tools. All of those people <laughs> in th this current generation look at WordPress and other tools like it and go, what the hell is this? I don't want this at all. I want to be able to control exactly what it looks like. I want to share it with only the people I control so I know exactly who's seeing it. I want to interact with them in an ephemeral way and I want to push out the content. And the reality well, then, is a so lot yeah. of the stuff that, just let me finish. Right. A lot of the stuff that we used to do on blogs was exactly the same thing, except the only way we could publish it was through a blogging platform like WordPress. My argument is WordPress and tools like it have not caught up with the user behavior of the regular user. Because the, the notion of everyone who wants to publish something online is gonna use a CMS simply doesn't hold true anymore. So what we're going to see, and what we're already seeing is that all the people that use to turn to blogs to publish the content, the majority of them are turning to existing I'm sorry, solutions. I'm sorry. And then you have the businesses wanna, and wanna, everything wanna, that are still I, using WordPress. I want to put this. I want to put this to the rest of the audience, but I am just not following your argument here because, for God's sake, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter—they're all content management systems. You've got no freedom about how you position your bloody images on these enclosed. Content. What did I just what? show you? I showed you Instagram stories specifically because that's where people are publishing because they can control exactly what happens because they just make pictures of what I they want and then publish it. I'm going to let Stephen. Stephen, what do you think? Uh, Morton's point is a very interesting one because even though you do have like these more traditional content management systems on Instagram, right? Like the images you post, more and more content is being shifted to the stories or the ephemeral parts of those platforms. And I think the reason why is because we live in this very interesting world where content has to have high shock value, but we also live in an interesting world where we dig back through people's content and penalize them for things that they said, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And so since we have to fulfill those two niches, the thing that does that is the content that only lives for a short amount of time. I can post crazy things on my story and unless you've seen it in the time span that I posted it, it's dead then. And I can keep my followers engaged and interested and say really controversial things, but not have to deal with the repercussions of that 10 years later down the road. And I think like that's kind of like that tension that is being resolved. So the idea that blogging is dying, I think is because of that. And once those things change, once those two levers change, we'll see a shift from this ephemeral content creation sort of thing. But we have to wait till society is ready to change yeah. those two. I want to, I want to put it out to Vito because he needs it. Vito, what do you reckon of this discussion so far? So I think that uh, WordPress serves just a different purpose than anything else that's been discussed here. Uh, it's um, the way I see, the way I've been using it for more than 10 years is uh, as a business platform, as a, as a way to, um, to present something that you don't want to go on, that you want to do it once and you want it to stay there and work for you instead of uh, disappear, dis disappear like that. So there is a use case for, you know, if you compare it to blogs, I can see this exactly from Steven's point of view as well, uh, as well as more than that it's, um, you know, it's nice that I obviously don't think the same as I thought five or 10 years ago. So if someone would catch uh, one thing that I said on stage back then and brought it to today's world, it would sound uh, off maybe. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes to doing business and, uh, you know, uh, working with WordPress as a channel uh, for, your, for that, um, I, I still don't see a comparison out there uh, for that kind of freedom. That being yeah. said, the, yeah, the, the UI, and the, the, I agree that the UI is just stuck like uh, uh, 10 years ago, mm. and, uh, and it doesn't serve the purpose now. I'm, I'm actually, I'm working on, on, uh, on this platform right now that I'm battling so hard to not use the WordPress dashboard for what we're, what we're creating and try to bring everything to the front end so I can control the flow, uh, control, minimize things more than everything. Uh, if you're looking at SaaS uh, solutions that are out there or, you know, any software that is out there, 
It's all about the simplicity of it. And that, I think, comes again to what Morton is saying on these tools. And WordPress, while it's feature-rich and it's awesome for us as professionals because we can navigate the whole thing, it's definitely not an accessible tool for, uh, for newbies or for non-tech savvy people uh, with how it is now. I feel that for them, yeah. it will look like how we looked at WordPress. Uh, if you remember those, uh, those content management systems that people used to build uh, on their own, like uh, the beginning of the 2000s, that it was just a mess and everything is all over the place. So I feel that people that go into WordPress now feel the same way that we did. So, we so, so, so Morton, are you saying, you know, I think Stephen and Vito have put the two criticisms, which I would agree with you. Are they the really the two main things, what Stephen remarked about and also what Vito's saying about the actual UX design? Well, my the title of my article is Blogging Dead. Long live FM. FM well, that's like, not what I don't agree that, with. That, yeah, <laughs> so, so, FM morality. Sorry, I'm too tired for this. The, uh, yes, they're both correct in that the, the uh, what tools like WordPress once served, those users have walked away and chosen other platforms. And tools like WordPress should stop trying to chase those users if they want to survive because the users that are actually using these things, WordPress, Gatsby, everything else, are the people that are building websites for permanence. But as long as you try to chase the people who are now shifting over to ephemeral platforms, you're not, you're building services that are completely um, are completely pointless because no one actually wants that anymore. You can see a very good example of it in the, the relative failure of AMP in WordPress. And you're seeing how like AMP tried to push this AMP stories or whatever it is, but it's basically the same idea that you can use AMP to publish these stories, but they're web-based and, the, and everything about that idea is the right idea, right? You're, you're not putting it in a walled garden. You're actually publishing proper text instead of images of text. You still get all the layout. You get all those features. No one is using it because it's way too complicated, right? And it doesn't live on the phone or on the tablet people are using. It doesn't have plugins that, and filters and all that shit that people want, right? So the, the, my thesis and the thesis of the guy who wrote the other article is that this industry as a whole has sat too long on its laurels and has let the world run away and is now trying to catch up, but is catching up as if nothing has changed. What needs to happen is like, if I was in charge of a project like this, mm -hmm. I would just get like, okay, stop. We need to actually go out and talk to our users and find out what our users want because our user base has changed dramatically from what it is. And our assumption that we know who these users are based on historical evidence is completely off. Of course, no one is doing that because that would have to, then you have to admit that you're going after a smaller portion of the cake now, right? And a project that wants to that control might the entire internet with somebody's is just plans not for do world that. domination. Yeah, yes. I, 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 and I think I understand a bit. I'm saying this, so Spencer, what, what do you reckon, you know? I'm quite frankly shocked that anybody still thinks of WordPress for publishing a blog. I mean, Morton, I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm surprised that this is even on anyone's mind because to my view of the world, WordPress long ago gave up. I mean, first of all, blogging yeah. lost its luster five years ago yeah. in the same way that, again, John Locke's not here, but like SEO has changed. So I'm really surprised that anybody still would consider putting effort into making a blog, especially on WordPress, because it is a hell of a lot of stuff to do versus just get an app on your phone and snap, snap, snap. And, and being a, a parent of teenagers and uh, knowing a lot of other parents with teenagers, they use Snapchat and things like that, not, not for a higher purpose, but because they could get away with doing stuff that their parents and other people wouldn't Yeah, see. but I, I think, I, I totally agree with you there, yeah. but I think, I think most people that are effectively using WordPress, they're not using it as a blog, really. Yet either. it is marketed for... That well, purpose. that, that, that and that's it's designed for that purpose, and all the development work is going into targeting that audience. Well, that's because they're clued out at the higher level. Which, by the way, yes. we miss you so much because in the last year or so since you've been gone, 
the, the daily or the Friday conversations have always turned to how lost is the management or how intentionally misdirecting is the management at Automatic about what WordPress.org really is versus what the world needs and wants. Because I don't know. I haven't been example. a part of this for a year, so I have no way of knowing. I'm That's saying, why I'm not you know, here. I have no saying, input for you. We miss those conversations with you because you usually had that inside line. But what we keep coming up with every week is how disconnected or intentionally misdirecting are they as far as their focus? Things like why Gutenberg is floating in space with all these problems and why, you know, WooCommerce now jams everything into Jetpack down your throat and installs stuff that creates dashboard tools. I mean, it's crazy what's going on. And I think this is an example of it. If you look at WordPress itself, WordPress as a system is thinking of itself like this when the, those of us here think of it like really good this, a very narrow tool for a very high purpose, a CMS first. I agree with your other premise though, that the, to go after blogging traffic is like going after text messaging business or something. I mean, you're 10 years well, too and, late. And, and for anybody going after blogging traffic is, it, is a bit uh, awkward. I mean, you know, it, it, <laughs> it's certainly, uh, you can go to Medium if you want to write a, a, a blog post, and various yeah. people do, although Medium has, you know, struggled well, considerably in its business model. But the thing is that some of those people who would once have used a blog to do X and are now using Instagram stories and something, mm -hmm. if Instagram had been around or if Snapchat had yeah. been around at the time that that they were writing those blog posts that's what they would have used yeah. you know in in a lot of cases young people do not want to broadcast something to the world and possibly come in for yeah. all random that was the point I was, uh, uh, that that they want to talk to their friends i and, think you i think you just made a fantastic point and it was a point i was just but i think you're totally spot on there sally I think this must move on to the next story before we go to the break and before uh, Morton has to disappear. Um, hopefully you come back um, for another discussion. Not so long, Morton. Uh, um, so um, on to story two, Sky Verge. We're joining GoDaddy. Uh, what do you reckon about this one, Chris? Uh, good for them. I mean, I know some of the team there and uh, I found it interesting that they had such a collection of WooCommerce products and then they pivoted into SaaS with Jilt, which is a yeah. cool tool working on a good problem. But to me, I just, I don't really have much to say about this besides the fact that I, re I really respect the team behind the software. And it's just another indication of the, the maturation of the WordPress ecosystem with consolidation with the hosting companies really leading a lot of that consolidation. It's just another data point. Right. Um, what do you reckon, Vito? Uh, congratulations, first of all. I think uh, it's. Um, I, I think congratulations from both sides because uh, the guys of Skyverge. I think that, that focusing on Jilt is a smarter move from their part. Uh, but I also think that uh, GoDaddy uh, needed uh, this uh, pool of products uh, to start competing competing with WooCommerce as they're building like their service there, competing while partnering up with them. Uh, so that's kind of a friendly, friendly neighborhood. Uh, but the point again is that everyone is trying to create that experience of a flow. And I think that the, that more than WordPress, the hosting companies are leading on that front as well. When it comes to, if you want to set up a website in five minutes, you got to have all of these tools. You got to have a way to integrate with FedEx or with UPS and now they have it. So uh, yeah. I think it's a great move for right. all that users and for the company themselves. Right. Molten. Do you think, the, the, do you think this is just desperate, really? Because hosting has just become a total commodity to some extent. And, what, and do you think. Spencer thinks that. Do you think. Quite clearly, you think this. You know, but, uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just the moderator. I, I just. Um, but, um, just putting but, yeah, words in you, people's mouths. Think, yeah, but seriously, do you think this is a sign a bit like automatic, the leadership automatic, where they still think this is a blogging platform and Jetpack drives m most of the traffic to the platform? You know, is this just a top management that's a little bit desperate and out, out of touch, really? Okay, so I'll paraphrase, uh, like, uh, prefix this by I have not read this, I don't care, I am out of the WordPress community, so I have no background history to this, but I can look at this from a larger uh, web perspective. 
Number one, this is the goal of capitalism, complete control under the hands of just one or two companies. Consolidation happens in a capitalist society. Eventually, everything will just be owned by two or three companies that control everything. So this is what's going to happen. Like, uh, GoDaddy three, four years ago was the most hated hosting company in the world because they killed their CEO or something was out killing elephants. Now GoDaddy is like, turned a new leaf by doing a new marketing campaign, is acquiring a ton of companies inside the WordPress space, inside other spaces, and it's really consolidating power because they have a lot of money, right? They have a NASCAR driver, they have all this other stuff. Um, what, uh, I forget who said it, is true. Uh, this has been predicted for a long time that someone would eventually start booting up a, a sort of a SaaS service for e-commerce e based on WooCommerce or something. I'm surprised that Automatic hasn't done this properly yet. We're because, all surprised about that. Because it, it, the big competition here is things like um, Shopify yeah. and Amazon, right? So you're going up against behemoths that only do this and do this extremely well. And... It, companies that want to compete in that market need to give a plug and play service that is somehow better than the services that are industry standard. And to do that, you need to acquire people who have the necessary skills to have all those pieces in place. So you can build these consolidated structures where you go, I want to sell this type of thing in this environment to these people using this payment service and then not do any setup. And the system does it automatically for you. Um, so I'm assuming just, guessing wildly here that that's what they're aiming for. That would be a really smart play. However, they are competing against monsters in the community. And the key to the other services is they only specialize on e-commerce and they take away the responsibility of payment handling, taxes, and other really complicated things from the user. Something that's gonna be super hard to do for a company like um, GoDaddy, unless they wanna just funnel all their money into it. So, it, I'm not surprised. This makes total sense from a world domination perspective, but this is like trying to be a world domination company in a space where they're already a world domination company. I don't know why is that the, that's the, the, the end, the end uh, kind of point though uh, um, around world domination, because I, I, I see this as just, okay, we have a bunch of users that do websites, uh, do WooCommerce websites. Let's, let's um, buy a company and add value. So that's oh. always smoother. That's, yeah. not how, that's not how capitalism works. Well, it's all about world domination all the time. Every company wants to be the company that serves because the best way of getting more business is by shoving everyone else out of the way, right? So you just want to consolidate power, funnel money into the people that will give you more power, buy the companies that are competing with you, eventually buy Shopify. <laughs> That's basically the goal of everything, right? Yeah, but I think you made some fantastic points there, Mo. You know, it's been, you know, it's been the totally incapacity of automatic after the purchase of WooCommerce to really move on this um, project on um, and I, I've been going on about that for the past well, two Well, yeah. Three, I mean, ever uh, since uh, it yeah. happened, we've been expecting there to be a, a yeah, it's just hosted total, commerce solution yeah, it's just from total automatic. Mad, just total madness, really. But um, uh, um, we're going to go for a break. Well, thank you for joining us, Morton. I know you've got to go off and talk to your boss. So and thanks for having me. Hope you join us uh, soon. Good to see you all. Don't, don't leave it a year, Morton. Uh, uh, um, um, we're going to go for our break, folks. We'll be back in a few moments. All right. I'm bouncing. Bye, y'all. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye, Morton. We're coming back. We had a lively discussion in the first half. I, I thought I kept it going, though. Uh, um, I think we made some interesting points. If we did, please comment on Facebook or YouTube and all the places that you can find our episodes of, the, of our Roundtable show. Um, before we go into the next stories, I want to talk about one of our other great sponsors, and that's Groundhog. Now, Groundhog is a native CRM system. Um, I think it's one of the best native um, WordPress CRMs that you can use to automate your 
online marketing through email and a load of other things you can do with it. Um, Adrian and his team have been really working hard on the on their um, solution, and I think it's really great, and it's just going to improve even more. So if you've been looking for a native solution, that's a lot more economical to use than some of the big SaaS players in the market, I suggest you go over to Groundhog and have a look at what they've got to offer. I think you're going to be blown away, not only for yourself, but for your clients. So go over to Groundhog. And like what I said before, the main thing is if you decide to buy one of their packages, and I think you should, is to tell them that you heard about them on the WP Tonic show. So on to um, story three, um, podcasting during the pandemic, um, Costos, is it Castos, sees a 300% growth in new, pod, new podcasting. And I thought you, uh, I think Sally, you brought this story to the, uh, my attention. So what did you think of it? Uh, right. So it's, um, you know, I've been seeing, I, I see a lot of uh, podcasting uh, news because I subscribe to podcasting news, but uh, you know, there's been a growth in podcasting and, you know, some, some of us have less time to listen to podcasts because we usually listen in the car and we're not going yeah. anywhere, but um, a, a, that the production of podcasts has increased. Uh, <clears throat> Castos, I, I assume is uh, its name is related to podcasting, but interestingly, it means pure in a couple of uh, uh, languages. Um uh, and uh, so I, I do think that uh, the increase in the production of podcasts is part of the, you know, part of the quarantine situation. How do I reach people when I can't go talk to them? And the thing about podcasting, especially audio podcasting, is that it's a very intimate kind of a relationship. These people are, are talking right in your ears. They're often talking in a kind of casual way. You start to really feel like you know the host and, and so on. And so, you know, from the beginning of podcasting in 2005, some people have had very good luck using it to build uh, connections, to build trust. Um, you know, the, the problem is that, you know, every... I don't know, five or six years, somebody gets this idea that podcasting is a get rich quick scheme. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Uh, and I do not think it ever will be. No, uh, it's an it's a influence platform, isn't it, really, isn't it? Right. And, and this is the thing is that that kind of thing, it's, it, it can be a good relationship building tool. And there is no shortcut to relationships. You know, however you're developing them, uh, they just take time to develop. Uh, and it takes trust, you know, it's like my sponsors. I, I wouldn't spon allow a sponsor to sponsor the show if I had no belief in the product. And I sincerely say that. And the listeners and viewers, you know, they come to their own conclusion if I've been honest there. And hopefully they have come to that conclusion. So that's what the sponsors are buying into is that kind of credibility, isn't it? Right. And, and that is the thing is that, you know, the, the podcast hosts uh, do often have quite a bit of influence. Uh, you know, people are willing to at least kind of go and take a look at something if they if they mm -hmm. recommend it. And so that the um, conversion rate uh, for podcast advertising can be better uh, than for uh, more generalized uh, advertising, uh, not to mention even the, you know, uh, even the highest traffic uh, podcasts. Uh, last time I checked it, you know, the cost of advertising was not anywhere near what it would be on, yeah, on it's radio just or you're, TV. The bigger, the bigger your audience, the less focus it is, it tends to be. Um, so it's always a balance. So Chris, um, one, one area where podcasting, do you think it has any place in, in education, in somebody in the course, building courses? And uh, obviously the main thing is building an audience before you start a course. But I mean in the actual production of content. I've never actually seen anybody do that effectively. I don't know if anybody has, have they? Uh, well, it's, I mean, my daughters, who I've always homeschooled, uh, uh, there, I, well, I just went inside. One of them was listening to a podcast called Brains On, which teaches about some math and science stuff. Mm -hmm. Podcasting is as a education tool. 
It's very powerful. I've actually, I'm actually in conversation with the team at Castos about how we can work together. They're looking at these private podcast features to, um, you know, help serve the course creator, the membership site building community. Um, podcast because a lot of people are you know when the pandemic dies down I don't think it ever go back I think but I think so many people will go back to having to commute so being able <laughs> to listen that they're available through that commute aren't they a hundred percent and I mean I'm just so this is just a story for the contrast I've done a lot of long driving like driving from the east coast to Alaska well, I've done these drives a lot and I used to have to listen, be in the middle of nowhere, listening. And to you're either. trying to find a freaking radio station. And I, <laughs> and there's Alex Jones on coast to coast or whatever. Oh That's my, how I know. Oh I my God. <laughs> but oh, now like podcasts, like. Man, you just got me, just got me in a cold <laughs> sweat. You have Chris. I don't but know now. Oh my God, I'm just starting, my heart starts bleeding. (laughs) Whatever you're into, whether you need entertainment or you want to learn business, you want to learn marketing or you want to learn about science or you want to learn about history or how somebody revisionist history, it's all there. And uh, it's just a great time. This independent media, and I think one of the most exciting things is um, similar to the, the earlier conversation around the ephemeral content, it's not that things are going away. We just have more options. There's a lot more competition and different people pick and choose the platforms. But the idea of Joe Rogan might be having his own presidential debate on the Joe Rogan show, to me, I think that's cool. Like independent you think they're going to smoke weed? With the, uh, I don't know what he's going to do, but I'm just saying independent media. The, the decentralized independent media is booming. And education, um, in terms of the pressure on it right now to decentralize, with more independent learning, homeschooling resources, podcasting can play a very important role in all that. And, and I think it's just important for, for people to realize it's not just entertainment. It's not just adult learning. It can be used for, it's a very flexible tool, just like WordPress. It's, it, and it's, uh, it's super cool. Huge right. fan. And, and platforms like Castos, I mean, you know, there are a lot more tools for it than there were when podcasting started. But I felt instantaneously in love with podcasts because of the independent content which was all that was there and and you know if you look at the you know most listened to podcasts a lot of them are done by media companies you know they're they're repackaged radio shows or or whatever and that's fine i listen to one or two of those but almost all of them are the type of content where the listenership is such a narrow niche you would never be on the radio Right. Has it got any of the other panel we got any comments or should I go on to the next story? You're looking blank, the rest of your panel. All right, I'll go on to the next story. Uh, um, plugin authors can opt in to email confirmation for WordPress plugin updates. So, Spencer, what did you think of this one? Uh, not much because it only applies to people that are contributing authors to a plugin. So I'm not sure why this one even made the story list. Shall we go on to the, all right, all right. Well, can we on. ask the plugin authors? Uh, uh, I mean, you have, to have is, a, you have to be a contributor to a repository plugin for this to be relevant. And it's just a way to let them know if you can auto opt in into being notified of an email. It's kind of a weird story. Like uh, the, 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 the tires on the garbage trucks have changed and the, the drivers get to choose which brand or something. I mean, well, that's right. one of the re- that was one of the reasons why I chose it, actually, because I thought it was a bit weird. But there we go. Uh, well, yes, I, was, I wasn't quite sure of the point, but I figured we have several um, plug-in authors here, uh, a, a, and they might have a, 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 something to suggest about, there's you know, always a is point, this relevant Sally, or I, not? Sally, I can assure you there's always a point. It's just I've got a devious English mind. Oh, I didn't, uh, I didn't mean what was uh, your point so much as what, what was the point what, of, of their what, setting my, it up. My, my th- what I would have thought the story would have been about, but it hasn't existed yet, is what we alluded to last week, which would be after the confusion between should you update because of Elementor versus you got to update for, because of the file manager fiasco. I thought this was a story initially about some kind of intermediary red flag type of a device in the repository that could shut down any plugin that was found to have a, a problem, which would save people's sites from having to be rebuilt. That's a feature waiting to happen that could be implemented. Sadly, that wasn't the story. But the next story is actually useful, the one about the O embed, because yeah. that's another 
like a political kind of controversy about the power of oh, we'll show you because Facebook decides to put another brick in their oh, wall. Can you before you before you can you give a quick outline? What was there? So let's jump to story five then. But can you give a quick Facebook? outline? Well, the Facebook story is basically that there was a premise with Open Auth, which is the ability. Uh, I'm sorry, to, not Open Auth with O Embed to have content that was cross-site compatible in the same way that OAuth was supposed to allow different platforms to authenticate a user. So you could, for example, use your Facebook credentials to get into Google and your Google credentials to get into WordPress. But the promise of that fell flat because nobody contemplated, oh, maybe these large conglomerates do not want to actually share their users across platforms. And they made it as difficult as possible. With this, there was a standard, which is kind of like a USB cable of you have content and it's accessible through the API without any hassle to just embed. Think of YouTube wait, videos. Wait, where was the last time you had to go and get a Facebook API key? And, and let's not even talk Very about the Google, because, Google API keys. Well, both of them, but like both of them are just basically building the wall after wall. So like imagine with YouTube, right now you could take a YouTube video, you grab the share uh, button, it gives you a little snippet of code. You pipe, put it into anything, anywhere, HTML. It works. Imagine if when you wanted to embed a YouTube video, you had to go sign up for an API key and a developer account. That's essentially what Facebook just did. And so WordPress said, we'll show you, and we're going to make all your plugins stop working that uh, you know do the reciprocal with WordPress content. And the whole thing is asinine because it just demonstrative of the fact that none of these companies were ever authentically interested in sharing content in the same way that when you use Facebook now, try to go to any normal group where there's content with compelling stuff and you try to share it. You have to be a developer like me. Use the console, get in the inspector to grab the actual URL of the content because so much content cannot be viewed outside of the walls of Facebook. That's intentional. And I think that that's not, un, uh, it's not unexpected, but it's just the sort of, we'll tell you one story to pacify you and then the reality is different. And, and this is why I advise people to use Facebook, but don't get, you know, you know, there's different stages, but don't get totally enamored by it and, and put so much of your content on there, any unique content, because, because of their fundamental attitude, which you've just so clearly expressed. So, Chris, what do you reckon about this one? Story five. Um, this, I just want to make sure I'm on the right story. This is about the API change for yeah. Facebook. That's the one. Um, well, single sign-on, it's just that I, I like what Spencer's saying with like this disconnect from what the users want. Users really want single sign-on. Like if I'm comfortable with LinkedIn or I'm logged into LinkedIn all the time, I should be able to go anywhere and use it. And uh, same with Facebook or whatever. I mean, I get this feature request constantly in the LMS industry. People want social mm -hmm. login. They want single sign-on. Um, but it, tie, it ties into the conversation earlier about capitalism and protecting, like not every tech community is gonna put the user's best interest above their, um, their own gain. By ha and they do that by protecting, they build walled gardens or fences around certain things, which is, um, they have the right to do that, but it's one of the reasons why, why I'm way more into WordPress where things are more open and decentralized, mm -hmm. but we still as users, are not always in the free open source area and there's different players in the space. We still need to use all these other tools and Google and Facebook and Amazon and all of it. So it's, um, it's, it's a complex deal, but I, I, it's always, it goes back to whatever that thing was with Apple and Steve jobs had a beef with whoever. And then you could never open this certain type of file over here. It's, it's really annoying from the user perspective. Well, it's been an ongoing kind of event. Oh, yes. If we, really, if we really want to get into potential controversies, there is the fact that NVIDIA just bought uh, ARM uh, uh, processors. And NVIDIA and Apple have had a massive war for decades. And um, Apple had just spent like some stupendous amount of money on transferring all of their chips to ARM. Yeah, I'll be that yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's a chess game between the higher players. And the people who are surprised by this are unfortunately naive, I think, because at the end of the day, you've seen this historically long before technology in all the physical world stuff, right? You'd have 
a, a service or a company that was very popular, but it was smaller, it would get bought by a larger company, a conglomerate. And Morton's suggestions earlier were spot on. In this case, what's ironic is that the whole purpose of OMBED to exist was to make things easier to share. So in other words, it wasn't like it was a core feature of the product that they've just suddenly shut off. It was just a sharing feature. So they essentially just said, we've given up on the concept of sharing. Some people alluded to the fact that you might start charging for it like you did for Google Maps, but I don't think it's the same thing. Google Maps was always a feature that was just happened to be free and they finally got around to trying to monetize it. Oh, Embed was not a feature. It was my content, your content over here that they were saying, we're just going to allow you to uh, allow it to leak out. And so they're just doing this. I think it comes so, from, uh, yeah. from, uh, from a different agenda, uh, I think. So from the point of view of, uh, of users using Facebook, um, everything is becoming a lot more private inside, the, inside Facebook, in, the, in this ecosystem. Uh, so people are gravitating towards, uh, you know, we're I'm not about sure you can actually use so, the words private and Facebook in the same sentence. Yeah, I, I mean, okay, more private. <laughs> um, so I mean, like people are talking inside groups so that you, you like uh, other people can't access this content uh, using those stories that disappear and all of that kind of stuff. So um, I, I think that it, it comes from, uh, I don't think it comes from that bad place as you guys were talking about this. I do think that it works a very, very uh, in tune with what users are asking for, which is not to share, which is I want to work with my smaller group, with my gr small group of friends within that kind of designated area where I can post content. I don't want it to leak and be post shared all across the internet uh, to be found 10 years later uh, to some degree. So I think it actually makes sense uh, uh, from that point of, from the user's point of view. But also, Facebook is so massive that they don't need it to be shared everywhere. Uh, they're actually uh, signaling to their users that if you want to consume Facebook-related content, go to Facebook and con consume that content over there, uh, which, you know, it, make, it makes sense. They did a change from when YouTube came up with the embed, you know, like which they, they made it very, very uh, uh, public and very, um, mm. uh, you know, they commercialized the embed feature. Uh, but they and it, and it all they links people like nicely back to to YouTube, so that is a good feature for them. For them, yes, yeah, yeah. If we, if that's if the idea is is publishing is public publishing, then that's an interesting. Great. That's an interesting thing you pointed out, both you, Vito and Sandy. You know, this embed from YouTube, they've made it where Facebook. Facebook never seemed to go well, down. They just there. went for it a little bit, you know. Like they, they okay. YouTube was allowing uh, people to share posts and and videos and stuff, so let's do it, you know. But it it doesn't really align with the purpose of the platform. YouTube is a publishing platform. It doesn't have those smaller groups or things. Uh, you can create an unlisted post, or you can have uh, you can have it go public and share it around. Yeah. What do you reckon, Stephen? Well, you have public Facebook pages. And, and you have. Well, are you going to sleep, Stephen? Is this is this making you want to nod off? Uh, no, I. It makes me frustrated from a it's, user yeah. It's standpoint. all those late nights carousing in a city that's entirely shut down. <laughs> exactly. Uh, from like a usability standpoint, it makes me a little bit frustrated. Um, I also, from a business standpoint, I'm a little bit surprised that they're doing this, just because to get an Instagram feed on somebody's website, which is like a very common thing probably will become less common. And so the distribution of what's happening on somebody's Facebook page or their Instagram page or whatever becomes harder and harder and harder. And that difficulty in doing that is feels like it wouldn't add to the platform. But I guess the platform is probably as big as it's going to get. Like how many new people are going, are getting on Instagram or how many new people are getting on Facebook because of something that was just distributed across the website. Uh, probably not that many, uh, but from a usability standpoint, I don't know. It's just, it's annoying. <laughs> right. Although Instagram is a public platform in a way that Facebook isn't. Sure. Uh -huh. Right. Let's go on um, this dump story six, because um, I don't want this to be war and peace. Let's go on to our recommendations of the week. And uh, um, Vito put me on to this and um, um, the developer is going to be coming on my interview show in the near future for a chat. And um, it's something called WP Carl. 
Um, basically, if you've ever been in that horrible loop of trying to, ha to arrange a meeting online for Zoom when you've got multiple people, it can soon become a kind of calendar invite fest. Uh, um, and this particular plugin, I've not used it in anger yet. I am going to give it a go. Um, it's a WordPress plugin, so it's a native solution that gives you one place where multiple people can choose a calendar time to have their online meetings. And so, um, so like I say, if that's interest for you or your clients, go to wpcal.io and have a look at that. So um, all your recommendations, if you can put them into chat, panel that really helps me so chris have you got anything to recommend to the listeners and viewers yes there was a i had one that somebody showed me yesterday for audio hosting but i can't find the name of that i'll bring it back it starts with a p but um instead i'll go with uh cadence wp it's a theme it's a really great theme that that is currently having a lifetime deal so if you're watching this live um there's about seven more days left on their their lifetime deal for their theme and they have a block library that looks really good i see it kind of taking off in popularity so that's my tip cadence wp mm, yeah it's great um I, I use their oh. block library a lot you oh, do? Right. cool they're from montana or something i don't even imagine that coming from montana uh rob there we go uh rob sorry sorry montana uh rob hey, uh, jonathan I, I don't know if you know but i would live in montana when i started lifter lms so yeah, I'm just I throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know. He, he, actually, he, actually, he actually comes from New York, actually. You know, all this era. <laughs> right. Uh, this yeah, well, I mean, you know, of, P Pippin right. Williamson comes from, you know, the far reaches in the Midwest. So. Exactly. I was being very sarcastic. Like Chris, Chris, I picture Chris, he shuts off the screen. And then, like, the backdrop zips up and he gets into his Lamborghini in South Beach, Miami, and he drives <laughs> off the club. It's just all it's, this it's all created folks. It's, it's, uh, it's all a load of crap. But that's that's that. Um, that. <laughs> all right. As to Spence. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Spence. Uh, got anything you want to recommend? I, I put up a link for uh, the plugin is really helpful for what happened last week. The gotmls.net service has a plugin, anti-malware security and brute force firewall, or at least this is the plugin that connects with it. Basically what it does is it's a deep and very effective scanner for all the shenanigans that got exploited last week when there was the problem with the file manager plugin, about 700,000 sites. So if you have any kind of issues where you're thinking that you might have been infected, this actually does a great job connecting to a free service, which gives all the uh, the profiles, let's put it like that. The, the, they have a word for it, but the definitions of known threats. And it allows it to search your site for any of those things within your code, thereby giving you a very inexpensive, free way to see if you've gotten any problems, even if they're not apparent yet. It's worth mentioning that some of the bad guys put in shell scripts. In layman's terms, they put something in the database. It's like planting an egg. And the egg can be launched into the actual file system at a, a future time and the egg hatches and it creates the, the, the bad outcome. And then you go and clean it up and you think I'm all finished, but then another egg gets hatched later. So you need something that looks for these kinds of definitions. And this is that guy, and I was quite impressed with that. That, like kind that? Of sound, yeah. that sound effect. Yes, it's a, it's, uh, a, it's a good sound effect. I'm not sure about the analogy because, you know, la last time I, I checked, uh, um, Eggs are not usually planted, but... <laughs> well, they, they planted the chicken, and then it keeps hatching the eggs. That'd be a better metaphor. You're right. You but in other words, I had a couple of clients who this happened to where they actually enlisted Sakuri. And Sakuri is an outstanding service, by the way. If anybody has a problem like this, just hire Sakuri for 99 bucks, and they cover the site immediately for fix and then a whole year. But even Sakuri's team, for some reason, missed it the first time. And then I suggested to them, this is one of those shell things because I saw the actual shell script. So it's worthy of mentioning because the biggest downside is you can get your hosting company uh, to send you one of these letters that says, hey, somebody reported you as being hosting of a, uh, you know, a brute force attack service. And you didn't know that's happening because they're doing it on your site without you seeing it. Mm -hmm. We use mail care on, on all my support. No free, so no free lunch anymore. Yeah. Um, Sally. Sally, anything you want to recommend to the listeners and viewers? 
yes. Um, uh, I heard a, uh, uh, I'm, as I said, behind on the podcast listening, uh, episode 429 of the Shop Talk Show, which is about front end development, is an interview with David Dylan Thomas, the author of Design for Cognitive Bias and also the creator of the Cognitive Bias podcast, who went through basically every single identified po- cognitive bias and created a podcast episode of it, about it, and then, you know, some follow-on uh, uh, things, um, and has uh, written about a, a way to, to help, you know, overcome some of these issues. Um, uh, but he was talking about stuff that I know was dear to Morton's heart, so I'm kind of sorry Morton isn't here, but about ethical design and about ethics. I don't think, I don't think Morton... I don't think Morton feels that way. I think he was quite relieved to go at the half point, actually. Uh, um, uh, um, <laughs> Probably. Uh, just, anyway, uh, Design um, for Cognitive Bias and Shop Talk Show. There we go. Uh, um, he's a big boy. He can handle himself. Uh, uh, um, Morton has dealt with more shit than you dish out. Yeah, yeah. He's, um, he's gone against the king himself. And he's got the scars on his back. To show for it, uh, um, Steve is a br- he's a braver man than me. Uh, um, Stephen, uh, um, have you got anything you want to recommend to the listeners and viewers? Yeah, I um, <clears throat> I was digging into somebody's website, um, looking at some issues that they were having, um, and they had a really cool plugin called Happy Files, which is just an organizational plugin for media files, but it can also organize pages, posts, custom post types. Um, so Ooh, I would... sign me up. I, I saw something like that uh, recently, but haven't tried it. And, and like one thing that nobody seems to have updated for years and years and years is um, any kind of page tree plugin. The, the yeah. one I've been using is so ancient. Yeah, oh, you should is, this, is Happy File so you can find stuff in your media library better? Is that Yeah, kind of... yeah. You can find something in your media library better, but then you can also use the same exact system to organize your pages or your posts or stuff. So you're not like putting it into a category that you want to be displayed on the front end, but it's like more for like back end internal organizational methods. Um, and I've seen cool. like a lot of different stuff that people have used and most of it's just kind of like a little garbage, but a- this is what I saw about this. I was like, man, this is pretty cool. So nice. Nice. Great. make sure it's in chat for me. Vito, my beloved Vito. Uh, um, so Have you got anything um, to recommend to a, the listeners and viewers? Yes. So do you know how annoying it is when you go into, you need to go to the FTP and log in and find a thing. So there's a cool plugin called File Manager. <laughs> it, it does everything for you. And I have another one. Yeah, can we talk about why that was a bad idea, like ever to invent? Um, but <laughs> By the way, that was the best. I want to disagree on one thing. That is the best tool ever. The question is, why is it that they didn't give you SFTP built-in service to WordPress? Because everybody has a variety of hosting. Stephen can speak to this, but like, you don't ever want to deal with a client's unique, you know, file manager going in their cPanel. So this kind of service, that's what made that plugin so alluring. And there's like four versions of it by different authors. Unfortunately, with great power comes great problems because if a bad guy gets into it, They've got control over everything. That's right. Nice. They've got access to a whole well, lot more so, stuff so than, they, than they would that have you, otherwise. Yeah, I'm sorry to over talk, but it was well, anyway, I they, not, I had a real they were gonna they were gonna they, <laughs> they those types are gonna zoom in on that type of product, aren't they, Spencer? It's like um I mean it gave like special a, capability built in, yeah. Because once they got control of that, they could get to the root level of your server with the tool yeah. itself. I mean that's yeah. how speeds are up veto. So what do you yeah. want to recommend for veto? Um if anything, they should have just blocked it at the at the website level, you know, so you can't go back. But anyway, my point was uh, there is a, a tool called Big View, or Big View, uh, which is basically like a prompter, uh, which this is awesome. It's on your, it's like a mobile app that is on your phone or your tablet, and uh, it just looks like you're reading, you know, it just looks like you're looking at the at the camera as you're reading a script, uh, which is great for for uh, your customers, Chris. You know, for your um, for creating courses, it's perfect. Uh, but also all kinds of ads and messages that you want to do and you don't want to blab on. So this is uh, an awesome thing that I've been using for a while, and now it's on AppSumo. So uh, I should I will probably buy it. I, now I saw that it's on AppSumo, so I'll probably buy it from here. But I've been using it for about a year, and it's been awesome throughout that time. So that's why I'm recommending it. 
Oh, well, thank you so much, panel. Um, I also want to tell you, listeners and viewers, uh, Adrian from Groundhog is going to be doing a webinar with me um, in October, the first Tuesday of October, the 6th. And we're going to be doing it at 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, basically, we're going to be talking about everything around using a CRM, i.e. Groundhog, with your Lifter LMS or any learning management system, how you can automate marketing to make your um, course more profitable. And we also will be talking literally about all things CRM um, during the webinar. If you join us, you'll be able to ask agent questions directly. You get a lot more sense from him than from me. Uh, um, but I, I've actually um, been, um, I've had actually people say the last one was very interested and I did a good job. So I, I was amazed. Um, you can, how do you sign up for it? It's really easy. You go to the WP Tonic website. In the main navigation, there's a button that says free webinar. And you just, you just sign up and you'll be told when the webinar is coming up and you'll be able to join us and have a feast of knowledge around marketing automation around your learning management system. If that doesn't sound appealing, I don't know what does. <laughs> um, Chris, Chris, um, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to, Chris? You can just find me on lifterlms.com. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, just do a search for LMS cast and you'll find a show there if you're into creating courses. That's great. And Spencer, how can people find out more about you and what you're up to? Uh, Launchflows.com or uh, you can have a call with me to talk about your marketing automation from the front page of WPFusion.com. And Stephen, how can people... And Stephen is going to be my co-host on my Thursday show for the next couple of months. Adrian is having to concentrate on Groundhog for a couple of months, coding away in some cellar like Chris, Chris's Tom, never seen the day of light ever. Um, so Stephen has volunteered. God help you, Stephen. And uh, we have our, we've got a guest, but you're going to be joining us next Thursday, aren't you, Stephen? That's the plan. That's the plan. So how can people find out more about you, Stephen? Uh, head over to zipfish.io. Well, that's great. He's preparing himself. He's strengthening his mental nerves. Uh, um, <laughs> he doesn't look that worried, does he? He looks very calm, actually. Uh, Vito, Vito, how can... <laughs> How can people find out more about you? And what you got WPfeedback.co. Um, yeah, for project delivery systems. And if you look, I've got to say WP Feedback and um, Vito in general, if you're looking for a product that can really help you with your clients, WP Feedback is the thing to look at. And Vito and his team are so helpful. And Vito himself is, um, you're just a great guy, Vito. And Thank uh, thanks for your help. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up. Uh, folks, it's been a great round table. I've really enjoyed it. We'll see you next week, folks. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, Sally, does that bug?